Right, so yesterday you looked at uh, concepts of parallel programming, kind of parallel programming patterns to do with decomposition, pipelining, um, and then uh, you also later on had a lecture on programming models in the message passing and the influence of shared memory, distributed memory. Now, this lecture is, is building a lot and very closely related to those two earlier lectures, but here we're focusing more concretely on the, uh, the actual implementations, the actual libraries, um, how you can actually program in parallel um, in ways that use these underlying concepts and models. And of course, you've already seen examples in your practical exercises about how this has been done. So you've already heard this, or you've already seen in the code, you've already seen OpenMP and MPI mentioned a few times. So th these are the things we'll be discussing in this lecture. Um, so basically, the most important, well, what we'll start off with looking at is, is MPI, which is the de facto standard, extremely common for doing distributed memory programming. We'll look at OpenMP, which is de facto standard, i.e. extremely common for shared memory programming. Um, well then I'll mention CUDA, which is a very commonly used program model libraries, platform, etc., for doing GPGPU, i.e. accelerator programming. And I'll mention in passing another uh, some other approaches which uh, aren't quite as um, frequently used. So MPI, as you saw before, is used to do distributed memory parallelism using message passing. So just to remind you of the, of the model, it's that you have uh, processes which uh, cannot access each other's memory spaces. So variables are private to each process. The processes the work is divided up amongst the processes, but in order for the processes to do the work, you need to communicate data between them. And this is done explicitly by passing messages. What does MPI stand for? Well, it stands for Message Passing Interface. It is not a programming language. There's no such thing as an MPI compiler. It's not like Fortran, it's not like C, it's not a language. So it's available as a library, namely, a set of functions or subroutines which you can call from your source code. An MPI library implements a communications protocol essentially because basically what you're what you're doing is your um, or what people have agreed upon in a standard so I'll come to is some kind of protocol for how these messages should be passed. So just to emphasize then the the, the compiler that you're using uh, doesn't actually know anything about what MPI does. It does. It just recognizes the, the format of the function calls and the subroutine calls to the MPI library. It just matches your code that you're, where you're calling an MPI function to the code in an MPI library. And it links those two. So what is this business about the standard? Well, <coughs> MPI, I said MPI is a library, it's not a programming language. It's also a standard. So before anybody could actually program in, program using MPI, uh, then people needed to agree what this communication protocol actually um, should be. Um, and that was done through something called the MPI forum, which uh, was uh, um, basically people from, or experts from, uh, from academia, from industry, uh, vendors, uh, application developers and users, working together to figure out what would be a good protocol, um, a good standard um, to, to, to use and which would suit the needs of programmers, and which would provide, um, which would allow parallel programming on different platforms. The first version of this was drafted in 1993, and it's been continually developed gradually, gradually over the years. It, it, it changes, and we're now in version 3, and version 4 is being drafted. Um, the EPCC has had some involvement in the past, and also has currently quite a bit of involvement in, um, in this uh, in the drafting of the new standard. So how does that contrast to what I said about MPI being a library? Well, um, the MPI forum defines the standard. <laughs> Vendors and open source developers can then choose to create libraries that actually implement that standard. So they can, um, when I say they can implement to a version of the standard, and somebody might say, okay, a vendor might say, okay, we're producing a library which implements version 3.0 of the standard or 3.2 of the standard, which means that According to the standard, it has to have, it has to be able, you have to be able to do these things with it. You have to do 
it has to have these subroutines, these function calls, which do particular communications. How those are actually implemented is up to the library developers, as is typical for libraries. So there are a number of different libraries, a number of different implementations of the standard, um, but they should all support, whatever they are, they should support some version of the standard. And, and if, they, if you write some code that is valid according to the standard and the library uh, doesn't work, then that's a problem. That's the library's problem, essentially. So um, uh, examples of MPI libraries are MPH, MPH2, OpenMPI. And another example is Cray MPH. So Cray MPH is Cray's own special sauce flavor of, of MPH. Uh, which has been optimized for um, Cray machines, so it does. It, it should be implemented in, in such a way that it does communications uh, in, an op, in, a, in a really optimal way for the uh, hardware that um, Cray machines uh, have. In particular, the interconnect, which connects compute nodes together, which is of course the, the main um, route over which these messages pass. What are some of the features of MPI? So it's a portable library. It's a portable. It's portable because you can expect MPI to be available. You can expect an MPI library to be available on any HPC platform that you use. Now, if, you, if some some libraries have include additional functionality that's not part of the standard, if you choose to write a program that uses additional functionality that's not part of the standard, you might have problems with portability because it might mean you 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 require a particular MPI library, which is a dangerous thing to do. Because if you want to use your code on a different machine, it will not necessarily work on that machine. If the MPI library for which you developed your code um, is not available on that machine. So, but in principle, the standards define something that should be to allow you to write code that is portable. And this is one of and the fact that this is true has um, and the fact that uh, it's possible to install and implement libraries on many different types of machines. It's partly what has contributed to the success and widespread use of MPI. Um, so, as we said before, uh, it's based on, on a number of processes you running independently in parallel. Uh, and you can think of each process or each rank as an instance of your executable if you're communicating with other instances. And these are launched, these processes are, or instances are launched using AP Run or MPI Run or MPI. Something to consider is that um, in MPI, all the parallelism is, is explicit. You have to write code that tells your program when to send, when to receive, how to do it, when to do so synchronously. Um, these are issues which, if you, if you go to the um, course in the next couple of days on the API, you will get into a lot of detail with. So you have to design as a developer, if you're doing the programming, the, you have to design the parallel decomposition, and you have to implement all the communications that implement that decomposition. You have to think about how you'll divide up the problem, and how do you communicate the processes and when. So there's different kinds, there's kind of fundamentally two different kinds of communications within the MPI uh, standard of model. So there's point of void communications where you send a message from one process and receive it from that one other one. Um, both processes are therefore actively involved in communication. It can be done asynchronously, asynchronously which means that one of them can send and the other one can, only, can receive, wait to receive later. Now, uh, there's concepts such as blocking versus non-blocking, which I think Nick illustrated with the idea of having a difference between sending a fax um, versus um, uh, was it sending in sending in the message and a letter that you write. Um, and there's certain concepts. Okay, there's there's concepts here like synchronous, asynchronous, buffered, which I'm not going to go into now. You will see if you go to the API course in the next few days. Um, there's basically a lot of there's a lot of um, functionality in MPI that allows you to really uh, do almost any kind of communication pattern you can think of. So so far we're talking about point-to-point um, -point communications. Another type of category of communications, another type of category of sending and receiving messages, are collective operations. So collective operations, um, as I think you already saw in the, in the outline of, of message passing as a, as a model is that um, it's a communication that involves um, all or, or a subset uh, of, a, of the processes. Um, so the point of this is that um, it's, it means that you basically avoid the need to, you, to yourself write detailed point-to-point -point communications for uh, things like um, 
broadcasting uh, data from one process to all other processes, uh, gathering data in one process from all other processes, uh, doing a reduction operation, namely combining somehow the value of the private variable held by all, pro all processes to, to give some uh, to give the, the value uh, values of um, some variable that's, that's shared at the end of a uh, some, some section of work. All to all, where all processes send data to all other pro all, pro all other processes. So there's two reasons why it's good that the MPI standard and MPI library provide you with a simple um, library calls, functions, subroutines that you can use that implement these collective operations. Two reasons. First reason is because it saves you work coding this thing up. It saves you thinking about it. You can say, okay, I want my data to go everywhere. You can say all to all. Secondly, they've probably done it in a way that you will be hard pressed to write code up in a better way, in a more efficient way. Um, so basically, they've that, 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 that's true on several levels, including on the, so they've basically optimized, uh, library developers will have optimized the implementation of collective operations in a way that um, either from a, from a hardware agnostic point of view is, is optimal or by looking specifically at the hardware for a specific system, like for example, Cray and Pitch uh, is optimal. So Cray will have optimized the Cray and Pitch <coughs> API library to do collective operations in a way that is fast and low latency on Cray machines. So that's why if you can, you should probably consider using a collective operation if it's appropriate. So what does MPI code look like? Well, you've, if you had a look at the code from the exercise or exercises you've seen already, um, so this is some, um, so you, for example, you have to include, what's a library? So you include um, a header file and the, and the I header. You basically have, so these uh, lines in green are uh, subroutine calls to the MPI, MPI library. MPI init and MPI finalize, initialize and finalize you what is called your MPI uh, global communicator, uh, which is just a fancy word for um, your MPI uh, environment or your, 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 your um, yeah, it's, it sets up your, sets up and finalizes your, cleans up your MPI environment. Um, then there's two uh, routines here, and all they do is they uh, extract or record, just get, they get the value of the size of the, what is called the communicator. All this means is the number of MPI processes that are active in this communicator. And it gets the rank, namely, what is the rank of this particular process? It then prints that out. If, if you want to see more MPI code in detail, enjoy the next few days in, in the course. Um, so let's go to OpenMP now. Let's contrast MPI with OpenMP. So as we said before, OpenMP is shared, offers shared memory parallelism, and it uses directives. What does that mean? Well, let's just, let's just remind ourselves of the, the concept. Um, you open a P, you've got, uh, instead of having processes that are uh, independent and have private, by definition, always private vari variable spaces, in, in open a P, you have threads that um, uh, can share memory and uh, have access, in principle, to the same memory space. So that any thread can, in principle, alter any data. Um, that is seen by the other threads. There's no explicit communications. You're not sending or receiving anything. So, um, okay, what's OpenP actually stand for? Oh, it stands for Open Multiprocessing. It's an interface. Um, what, what is it really? It's a set of extensions to Fortran, C, C++, consisting of compiler directives. I'll get to in a second what a directive is, if you don't know. I mean, um, and runtime library routines, okay, there are some there are some library routines, although it's not primarily a library interface. There's some environment variables that are specific to OpenMP and which control the way that OpenMP parallel programs run. But unlike an MPI, it's not a library interface. Um, so as I'll say in the next slide, the compiler does need to know about OpenMP. It doesn't just link to some something that it doesn't know the internals of. It needs to know about OpenMP. Now what is a directive? A directive is just a line of code um, that has a meaning that's only recognized by compilers when they are specifically looking for looking to compile open code. So there's sort of keywords, some 
it says like, oh, this here, this is OpenMP code. If the compiler is looking for OpenMP code, code, it'll then interpret that and produce uh, executable code accordingly. If the compiler is not looking for OpenMP code, it'll just ignore that. So these keywords are also known as sentinels. So if it ignores it, it compiles the code as regular sequential um, C++. So OpenMP is also a standard. Um, you can see OpenMP um, sort of the form or whatever they call OpenMP organization. Similarly to MPI, it's a, it's a collaborative effort um, to define this uh, between uh, vendors, industry, experts, academic, academics, etc., etc. What are some of the features? So these directives, which I mentioned, what they what they actually do <coughs> is they define parallel regions within your code. So basically, what happens is that you start your code, you just run one instance of it, say one process. And your code gets executed, 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 and then it hits a bit where there's a directive, a line that says, "Oh, this is a this is an OpenMP region. There's some OpenMP stuff that it, that's going to go on here." Um, there's a keyword there, and then that so these directives define regions in your code where um, the work that is contained within the region is somehow distributed amongst the OpenMP threads that are available to your program. So the number of OpenMP threads that are available to your program are controlled by one of these environment variables that I mentioned, namely some, an environment variable named OMP num threads. Within these parallel regions, uh, you should decide, it's, it's best to decide explicitly um, which variables are private to each thread or which are shared. Um, you, can, you can say, oh, they're all shared, or you can say some of these are particular ones are private, you can say they're all private, you can say these are shared, these are private. But you should, you should, it's good practice to always indicate one or the other. Now, I said before that a compiler needs to actually know what OpenMP does because it is responsible for producing the OpenMP parallel, parallel code. But uh, so OpenMP is supported by all common compilers. You won't be surprised to hear. At least all the common compilers use an HPC uh, work. Uh, these should, of course, implement the standard, a particular version of the standard, of the OpenMP standard. As compared to MPI, the parallelism is less explicit. You're not explicitly sending messages. You're basically saying, make this parallel. And then you give, uh, there are some tweaks, there are some things that you can say, oh, do it in this way, do it in that way, do it in that way. And then your compiler just writes code that, that does that. And you can also, at runtime, tweak things a bit by, for example, choosing the number of threads, which is, is an important thing. Um, and there are other environment variables that can tweak at runtime how the work is divided. But basically, your compiler kind of just does it, and then you can then you kind of tweak it. OpenMP is a model that can also be used to program the newer generation of Intel processors, many integrated core processors um, like Xeon Phi, Knight's Landing, you may have heard of this, Knight's Corner, these kinds of things. So how how what does OpenMP code look like? Well, one of the common things that is done in OpenMP is to split the work within um, a for loop amongst threads. So uh, and open, uh, OpenMP directives are used to, first of all, well, are used to tell the compiler to divide the iteration of the loop between the threads, and you can do so in different ways. So the first li directive line here says, okay, there's a pragma, there's an OpenMP parallel region. Say, okay, here, this is the start, this is what I said, this is the start of, here's some stuff that's going to be parallel. And then you say that, here you make it explicit that uh, these variables, A, B, C, and chunk, are all shared variables. And there's a private variable for each thread, that's i, which is going to be the iteration. Um, then there's an additional st statement, directive statement within the OpenMP parallel region, saying, okay, in particular, I'm going to have a for loop. The for loop that immediately follows is going to be OpenMP parallelized um, in a particular way. So what's going to happen is that um, the iterations in this loop, each of which is updating this shared variable, by adding together um, by adding in, um, elements of the shared two shared arrays. Uh, so these iterations are going to be uh, so, so some so say say iterations one to ten will be done might be done by thread one, uh, eleven through to twenty might be done by thread two, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now you can control the way that the work is divided up by this schedule clause. Now I don't want to get into detail again. This is you know actually learning how to do lots of uh, OpenMP programming, but um, chunk, for example, is a variable which, which sets this, whether it's 
1 to 10 or 1 to 5 or 1 to 100. So that's the chunks in which you are, the, how you are chunking up the iterations of a loop and dividing it amongst the threads. Uh, another example, using a, um, a reduction operation, I spoke of reduction operation in, in MBI, but you also get reduction operations in, in OpenMP, um, where uh, you have uh, an OpenMP parallel region defined here, saying shared variables A and N, and you're saying that um, there's going to be, uh, at the end of this loop, I'm going to want to uh, do an operation where I combine uh, all the variables of a, of a where I combine the values, all the values of the, ver of the variable A sum as, pro as being private, which are private to each thread. I want to combine them by adding them, that's why the plus is there, um, and uh, add that to a, sh a shared variable A sum, which already existed before you started the OpenMP parallel region. So this does some, so there's no schedule, there's no, you can see this pragma OpenMP directive here is very simple. It doesn't say anything like schedule, etc. chunk, it doesn't say anything like that. It just does some kind of default behavior, which can depend partly on the, on the compiler. Um, and it adds, uh, it just adds elements of A. So each thread will have a value of A sum at the end of this loop. And then uh, at the end of the loop, the, the compiler, so what happens is that all those values get added together um, into um, a total value. So that's <coughs> MPI and OpenMP, which are some of the most um, important parallel programming models that you'll probably come across at least when you're starting. Although another very important pro um, parallel programming model library platform is, uh, is CUDA. So CUDA is um, essentially um, something developed by NVIDIA, the manufacturers of, of um, graphic accelerator cards and general purpose graphic accelerator uh, cards that have in the last 10 years so gained a lot of traction um, because they've been able to speed up, massively speed up uh, certain calculations. So CUDA again is an API. Um, it's defined and provided solely by NVIDIA. So it's proprietary, you typically have to pay for it. You have to get a compiler that can compile it. Um, and um, you have to pay for that. So what you do is you write, um, you write so-called kernels, which, um, meet, which so typically what you do is you try to execute a, a key computationally intensive part of your code, not on the normal processor, but on this separate card, the GP GPU, which is part of your um, your setup. So Archer has no GPUs. Um, some other machines will have, uh, uh, you know, lots of them, maybe one or two per node. So, um, and then you launch these kernels from within standard C programs. And the thing you need to do with, with CUDA, that's a bit different to, um, to OpenP, for example, is you need to uh, you need to explicitly, so the, the, the data that an op, the, the data that a CUDA kernel is going to operate on needs to be explicitly sent from the memory space of the device and of the say associated the memory space associated with uh, the processor that's running the, the main program. It has to be copied from there to the memory space associated with the graphics card, the general purpose graphics card, which is separate. Now this happens over a bus. Um, I visit with a hardware that you know connects these two memory spaces, which can be slow, and there's a limit. It can be slow. There can be latency associated with it, and there's also um, limited bandwidth. Um, so, really, the benefit from use, from using GPUs has really been to take very computationally intensive bits of code, which crucially uh, do pretty much the same kind of operations on lots of, on lots and lots and lots of times on different bits of data. Um, and to to and where where you can where the, the the cost of doing this transfer of data from the one memory space to the other memory, to the, from the device memory space sorry from, so other way around, from the host memory space to the device memory space the device being the GPU where the cost of doing that is worth the speed up that you get from having this GPU 
do the processing. And what TPU cards are is essentially they've got, instead of having four cores, eight cores, 24 cores, they've got hundreds of cores. They're simpler cores than you might find in a general purpose processor, but they are very, there's loads of them. Um, so they can be very effective. So they were traditionally used to, to calculate um, pixels for video games, etc. Um, so yeah, this is little, some details about uh, CUDA and GPUs, etc., which might be worth looking into. Yeah, so I mentioned that in, in with CUDA, with CUDA, you have to communicate data between the host and the device. In more recent versions, you can actually uh, be more efficient, and you'll have multiple GPU cards that can communicate directly between each other. This, this technology is called GPU Direct. This has a lot of scope for speeding up stuff, but it's not that common yet. Um, so here's an example of a CUDA kernel. Um, basically, what you're doing here is you're doing a vector addition, and you're saying a vector addition that has to be done not on the host processor, but on the GPU GPU. So um, you can see at the bottom here, the actual in, in your in your in your code. You'll, have, you'll be calling this function, you will back add, you will pass it some arguments, D, A, D, 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 C, D stands for, the D stands for device. So these are basically the uh, variables as stored in the memory space on the device, which you are then going to pass to, um, sorry, which, yeah, which will be, which will be given the values of the uh, data on the host. As that means a lot of, without getting into, Details of CUDA, which you don't have time for. There are aspects, things are like grid size, block size. These have to do with the way that um, the way that all these little cores in on the GPU work together. So basically, what happens is that um, you have. So when I, I said the GPUs have loads and loads of cores, and each and and to complement that, they have loads and loads of threads. So they have hundreds, if not well, they have actually much more than hundreds. They have thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of threads. So what these little cores are good at is rapidly executing and swapping between lots of threads. So, and that are all doing very similar things. So here what's happening is that, actually the number of threads that you will get is, I think the, the grid size times the block size. So the grid size, well, you can get hundreds and thousands of threads. So, and each thread will be doing something to just one bit of data. So the thread index, the thread ID is calculated by seeing where it is in this block and grid. Don't worry about that. The point is that um, it calculates just a value of one element of C, namely C ID. It just it just does that. That's all it does. Something very simple. Just that operation. And because you have so many threads, and because and, and it can do so efficiently, and it can it can schedule these threads in a, in a, in a very efficient way. It can overlap them. So um, that's what CUDA code looks like. It's good to be aware of. Um, Another model called OpenCL. OpenCL is essentially, uh, it's kind of like CUDA, but then open, but then open source. It's more of an open standard. So you can use it to, to you can use it to program GPUs, um, uh, including NVIDIA GPUs, but also other GPUs, uh, and Xeon clients. Um, it typically lags a bit behind in the functionality that it offers. So it's a bit because it needs to be developed in response to what is there, the hardware, and response because of course NVIDIA can develop. It. They're bringing out a new card. They've been developing CUDA alongside with it, so they can immediately offer the programming model that can take advantage of the new technology, whereas OpenCL just lags a bit behind. Um, and it can be harder to write for a video to be used than if you simply use CUDA. But it's more portable, um, also more susceptible to variability in performance. There's more mentioning it, so you've heard of it. Just to finish off, uh, I want to mention a couple of other um, sort of programming libraries and implementation, namely um, some of PGAS um, models. Um, these are types of types of shared memory, essentially types of shared memory programs. Um, examples are Core Ray, Fortran, Unified Parallel, C, and Chuckle. These programming languages are, are, are have never really caught on. So people play around with them, but there are not, no, or at least not many, uh, massively, uh, massive, very commonly used 
uh, code that that uses multi as far as I know. Um, there's also um, libraries that implement single sided communication, where the, 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 the model is slightly different from MPI, where instead of having all processes communicate, you just have processes communicating in one way. Without going into more detail, that's just something to be aware of. This is what Mr. Mem with Cray originated this. Also, it's not really just that much. Uh, open ACC or OpenAC. This is um, it's quite nice. It's actually uh, uh, an approach for programming um, GPGPUs or accelerators like that include GPGPUs, but also maybe things also done by Tetra. That in, that is based on directives. So, like OpenMP, which if if you think about it, if you looked at the code, I mean, it looks it looks a lot similar. So right, use directives because directives simply allow you to say make a parallel. Oh yeah, and by the way, tweak it this way and that way. Whereas with the CUDA code, you really um, have to explicitly slog through everything, do all the transfers, and you have to manage much more yourself. You have to think about the low-level details much more yourself. That's also a improvement, but OpenAC is, is nice because it does offer this directive-based approach. So to summarize, oh, summaries, I guess, what, what I started off saying in the beginning is that um, the de facto standard for distributed memory programming is, and is to use MPI. It's just so incredibly common, it's so incredibly ubiquitous. Um, it just makes a lot of sense to use it uh, whenever you want to do stuff that, whenever you want to exceed um, a single node. Shared memory programming within um, uh, within a node, uh, within a shared memory space, is different than using OpenMP. It's well, de well developed, quite a mature model, um, easy, straightforward to start off implementing, and you can tweak it quite nicely. And GPUs are mostly programmed using CUDA. Um, so kind of as a, so so the hybrid approach of using MPI plus something else, in particular MPI plus OpenMP, is extremely common in in HPC codes um, because it allows you to to make use of quite a lot of different uh, hardware layouts. As I said, you can use OpenMP for within uh, a node, possibly also for an accelerator if it's T node part, and you can use MPI to communicate between nodes, and you can use MPI also within a node. Um, there's nothing stopping you from sending messages within a memory space that is effectively shared. You can treat it as if it's distributed. Um, and there's another number of other more experimental approaches, and that's common, also mentioned. 